Hello, everybody. My name is Daniel Colodangelo. I am a undergraduate mechanical engineering major at Binghamton University. And today I'm going to give you a video on a topic of vibrations, and it's going to be an introduction to suspension dynamics. And we're going to use the quarter car model to model the vehicle suspension. So let's get right to it. So let's start out with some brief history. So basically, these suspension systems, they've been around for a very long time, as early as 1300 BC, recorded in ancient Egypt. Uh, devices such as chariots, catapults, and weapons such as the crossbow were already using suspension technology and coil springs, even as early as, as back then, people were figuring out the concept. So a lot of what we base our suspension system concepts off of is Hooke's Law, which was fully developed in 1678. Basically, that says that the force needed to extend or compress a spring by some distance is proportional to that distance. That helps us determine basically how stiff our spring needs to be based on the loads being applied and basically what we need to do to develop a suspension system. So the first coil spring system was actually patented in 1763, and that's kind of where we've developed for current day suspension systems based on past uh, developments. So we have a few other examples, such as the Moore's Automobile Factory in 1902. They added the first shock absorber in the suspension system. Basically what this does is it provides a sort of damping to the system through the use of either a viscous fluid or a piston cylinder, and it's going to help make some of those rough patches die out when you're hitting a bump. We also have the Brush Brothers in 1906, and they created the first coil spring front suspension with the shock absorbers mounted. So they basically took the two concepts, put them together. And this is really where we've developed since then in terms of making vehicle suspensions. So essentially how it works, and you can see this diagram on the left, we have our car body that's going to attach at the top to our strut and our structural support. We're going to have a combined spring mass damper that's going to help us make those vibrations die out. We also have our wheel and tire, also crucial to the system. And they also have their own stiffness as well, which we take into account when developing a suspension. We also have our hub assembly, which is basically where the wheel and the tire connect to the rest of the body of the car. So we have a few parts. We have our tires, our shock absorbers, our springs and linkages, and that's going to provide all the support and link everything together. How does it work? Well, the goal is to really absorb energy and to reduce the vibrational motion of a car hitting a bump. We also are trying to reduce the impact forces so that whoever's using the car has a smoother ride. And we also want to keep the car upright and aligned on the ground if it's hitting bumps or going over bankings. We want to make sure that it's aligned so it's not flipping over. So again, we have our coil spring. Basically, the stiffness will determine how well the car can absorb a bump. So if you have a spring that's too loose, you're going to get a lot of roll and sway and the car is going to basically oscillate around more than you want when it hits a bump. Uh, you can use stiffer springs, but it's definitely going to, you're definitely going to feel the result of using a stiffer spring. And a lot of race cars use this actually because they can handle a lot of the higher forces and stresses as they're going at very high speeds. We also have our shock absorber. As explained, it dampens the motion of the vehicle. And it usually will do this by dissipating the kinetic energy into the form of heat in a viscous fluid, such as a piston cylinder that's going to be filled with an oil or some other fluid. Basically, the shock absorber is purely based on velocity, so it's sensitive to velocity, and basically the higher speeds will increase the shock absorber resistance. And then we have our struts and our sway bars, which are the structural supports that basically hold up the system, and they also provide their own component of damping as well. So one of the most important things we're going to do is we're going to model the suspension. And how can we do that? So we're going to take a look at something called the quarter car suspension model. Basically, you're able to decompose the suspension system into a quarter of the total suspension. And you basically can piece it apart and you have your body of the car, which is going to be your mass sprung. And you're going to divide that and separate it from your mass unsprung, which is going to be the mass of the tire the structural supports and the suspension arms. So you're able to split this up and analyze the motion between these two systems. So you have KT, which is going to be your stiffness of the tire itself. And then you have your KW, which is going to be the stiffness of those coil springs and those shocks and the wheel. Then you have CW, which is the dash pot or the shock absorber coefficient essentially in your system. You have your YU, YS, and YG. And basically what this is going to allow us to do is measure the motion of the system as it's hitting a bump or going over different road conditions. 
And so your YG is going to be just the road motion. Your YS is the motion of the car itself. And then your YU is going to be like the motion of your tire and your uprights and the rest of the suspension components. So one of the things we always like to do in vibrations when we're coming up with the equations of motion is we want to take the sum of the forces. So here we consider the upward direction to be positive. And just note that in these equations, I have the variables Fu and Fs written in. And these are going to be additional forces such as the aerodynamic forces experienced on the system. But for the purposes of this analysis, we assume they're zero just to show an example of the suspension by itself. So basically what you want to do here is you want to just determine basically on each of those masses, both unsprung and sprung, what's pulling energy away from the system and what's adding energy to the system. So you have your force equals ma or here y double dot and you have your velocity which is going to be noted as y dot and then you have your position which is just y so basically you know that springs based on hook's law and based on previous discussions is going to be based on the displacement then you know your damping is going to be based on the velocity so from this you're able to form the equations based on the direction of motion of each of these components in the system so when we're basically plotting our results, we're able to calculate the acceleration. And the question is, can we solve for more? And the question is, yes. If you're using a program such as MATLAB, you can also get your velocity and your position at each time step. So in this model that we analyze, our time is set to be three seconds. So basically, through MATLAB, we can set our time step, basically how many intermediate points between zero and three seconds. We can set that to one millisecond to get a nice accurate representation of the system. So if you wanted to plot your velocity and position, just knowing the integration and where each of these parameters comes from, you can get your velocity from the acceleration and the velocity at these different time steps. You can also do the same for position and that's gonna be based on your velocity. So basically, to show an example of how we can model this suspension quarter car model, we have a few different road conditions. So we basically have some bumps and we have some ramps. So here shown in the figure, we have a one inch bump. You can see by the position versus time, it's constant. And then we have a one foot ramp. You can also see the position versus time and it's actually at an incline. And then the ramp is actually allowed so that the vehicle can travel and leave the ground. So for this model, it's always important to have the proper numerical inputs. And what we're using for these are essentially some common values given for Baja and Formula SAE cars. So basically we can get an idea of the loading and the weight of each of these sprung and unsprung masses. We can get the stiffness of our tire and our suspension, get some of our damping. And basically the ride frequency is just going to be the natural oscillatory motion essentially of the vehicle. So that's listed in Hertz and we have two different values for Baja and Formula SAE. What we can do from this is then we can plot the forces, positions, and we can get our velocities as we desire basically over different time steps. So we're going to start with the first case, which is hitting a one inch bump. So basically in MATLAB, we modeled the bump the same way that was previously shown in these other slides. And you can see on the right, the position versus time, that blue line that's labeled ground, that is the road. So that one inch position is the bump. So at time zero, the position is actually zero, but then the bump just comes out of nowhere and then the car is gonna hit the bump. So for the purposes of this video, we have the force and we have the position plotted over time. So we have our sprung mass and we have our unsprung mass. So remember the, if we go back to our previous slides, basically the sprung mass is going to be based on the suspension and the unsprung mass is going to have to do with the tire. So if you look at the diagrams here, we can see that the unsprung mass takes a lot more of the impact forces and the sprung mass is going to experience lower forces and that's due to the damping and that's due to the suspension system helping to sort of decay and die out some of those forces that are actually acting on the system. So we also can see that the position over time, we see that the sprung mass sort of oscillates slightly and then it returns back to the bump. So basically when it hits the bump, it's going to bounce and then come back to its initial position. Basically what you want to do is you want to eliminate the amount of bounces to a minimum if possible, but you still wanna allow the system to slightly oscillate so that the suspension can move a little bit. So basically what we have when we're talking about damping is our damping ratio, which is called zeta. And there's three, basically three cases we're talking about here. So if you have a system 
that has a zeta value between about 0.5 to 1, you would call that underdamped, and that's going to cause a lot of oscillations, depending on which damping ratio you use. Then you also have zeta equals 1, which is called critical damping. Critical damping will allow the system to return to equilibrium without experiencing any oscillations. Then you have zeta greater than 1, which we call overdamped. And overdamped is also going to allow the system to return without oscillation, but it's going to take much longer. So the system's essentially, it's going to be a very slow suspension system in terms of taking those loads. So we basically evaluated this at different zeta values to reiterate this point. So we have our zeta at 0 0.309, and that's what we call underdamped. So we basically, you can see judging by the forces and the position, you can see the wild oscillatory motion once the car hits the bump. So you can see these forces take a long time to die out versus previously where they died out within almost 0.1 seconds. Now you can see the both the sprung mass and the unsprung mass are oscillating significantly. We want to avoid this sort of ringing response, and this is mostly due to lower damping in the shock absorbers. So you want to make sure you have the right shock selected to avoid this sort of undesirable response. So we have the critical damping case. You can see on the position on the right that the system, the sprung mass and the unsprung mass don't oscillate. So basically they hit the bump, they go up, and then they return down to zero. So there's no oscillations after hitting the initial bump. And you can see the forces are very similar as well. Then we have the overdamped case. So you can see that similarly, there's basically similar forces acting on the system, but you can see the oscillations also decrease but you can see how much longer it takes for our sprung mass to return to the ground. So there's going to be a lot of time taken before the suspension actually fully absorbs the impact of hitting this bump. So this is what you want to uh, avoid typically, and you actually want your zeta value to be slightly below one. You want to allow a little bit of flexibility in the suspension so it's able to bounce and it's not going to cause too harsh of an impact. So, and then this is what happens if you have basically an uninflated tire is then you're going to experience uh, basically some reduced stiffness and the shock absorption improves, but you can also damage the vehicle. So you want to avoid that case if possible. Next, we took a look at launching off of a one foot ramp. So the figure on the right, once again, you can see the position of the ground is that inclined ramp that sort of falls off and goes back to zero. You can see the position of the car, uh, the unsprung mass and the sprung mass. So the vehicle is allowed to leave the ground now. And you can kind of see how it's traveling in the air, it's hitting a peak and then it's falling back down. Position actually goes below zero and that's because the suspension relative to its initial position is then compressing and it's sort of going into the ground as it lands. And you can see that with the force graph on the left. So basically when this car is hitting the ground again, it's going to absorb some compression when it hits the ground. So you can see by those force curves. And actually, if you see the few peaks that occur after that sort of dip into the negative force area, that's actually the system bouncing when it lands. So the suspension, once it hits the ground, it launches in the air, it hits the ground, and then it's going to bounce a little bit. So that's actually showing the bouncing of the system. And this is with a zeta value of 0.824. So this is about what you would want slightly underdamped case, a little bit of oscillatory motion, but nothing too crazy. So then we have our underdamped case, and you can see why, once again, we want to avoid this at all costs. So once this system comes off of the ramp, you can kind of see compared to the previous case, you can see it's actually going a lot higher. And basically what's happening is you're getting a lot of oscillations when this vehicle lands and you can see that the car just keeps repeatedly bouncing up and down because it can't really absorb the motion it's having a tough time absorbing the motion so this is when you have very low damping as a result you're going to experience those forces for a long amount of time and that's going to be very uncomfortable you can damage the vehicle so you want to avoid this if possible then we have our overdamped case you can see that there's a large spike in forces when it hits the ground and then the car actually takes a while to return to zero, similar, similar to what we talked about in the one inch bump case. And basically, so what we can do with these graphs, if we just go back to these, is we can just continue to 
sort of play around with the value of our shocks and our springs. And we can kind of see how varying each parameter is going to vary these curves. And we can also look at velocities and we can look at acceleration specifically if we want. And there's just a lot you can do to basically get a rough sense of what's going on in your vehicle and the effects of modifying your shocks and your springs and just you know how that will cause a change in your suspension. So in summary, we want to also minimize the unsprung mass. You want to have as light as possible of a system on the bottom so that the car itself can safely return to zero or its initial position without having too many oscillations. You want to get as close to critical damping as possible with your zeta equal to one, but you want to have a slightly underdamped case to allow for some flexibility. You want to avoid making your suspension too stiff just because that's going to make it very uncomfortable and an undesirable ride. You don't want to make the suspension too loose though, because then the system's going to just keep oscillating back and forth and your car is basically going to have a very hard time absorbing any of those impact forces. And what you can do beyond this quarter car model is then you can look at a half car model, you can look at a full car model. So this is basically the simplified case of what you can basically work from to then analyze the entire car and see what happens in total. But basically, in summary, this gets you a brief idea of how the suspension works and how the car is going to interact with different road conditions that you can model. Like you could do a rounded profile, a larger ramp, a higher bump, you could do a banking. You know, the possibilities are kind of endless here, provided you put the inputs in correctly into MATLAB, you have your sum of your forces and you have the right equations. So I really appreciate you coming out and listening to this talk today. And I want to give a shout out to Dr. Chris Bachman and the Cal State LA Baja and Formula SAE race car design workshop. They had a bunch of great videos on this topic that I was able to review and learn more about how this system works as well. And I appreciate you listening. Here's my references and thank you. And I hope you have a great day.